road closures, ship rollouts, booster tests, it's been a frenetic week here in Starbase. And on top of that, we've seen possibly the most intense week of stage zero testing ever, with pretty much every part of the launch site being tested ahead of Flight 4. Plus, our satellite imagery partner, Skywatch, provided us with some really cool high-resolution images from space. From space! How neat is that? Howdy, Star fans. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. Sponsored by Novium. All right, before we talk about all the vehicle movement, let's cover our bases and discuss the ongoing infrastructure work all around Starbase. And we'll start off by saying hi to our new friend, the parking structure. We can see walls continuing to go up for the new parking structure behind the high bay. As you can see by the double row of cars parked on the side of the road, this extra parking is very much needed. The vertical columns of the parking garage are going up fast, and since it is, compared to other things SpaceX builds in Starbase, a relatively normal structure, we should see this entire thing completed pretty quickly. The parking garage is going up so fast that after just a couple days, it already is two levels high. And as a reminder, it's planned to be a total of five levels high when it's complete. Thanks to our satellite imaging partner, Skywatch, who provided us with some high resolution images of Starbase for this Starbase update, we can take a look at the parking structure from a different point of view. And I just have to take a moment to celebrate the fact that we're now using footage from space gathered for us for Starbase update. That's, I don't know, that's kind of cool. You can see the footprint of the parking garage next to the rocket garden, and you can see that it's quite a huge building. One small note here, this satellite picture is a few days old and things move so fast in Starbase, so consider that when looking at them. But either way, this is a great vantage point to understand the footprint of the parking garage. Over at the Star Factory, more glass panels are going up on the corner of the building, and we're finally starting to get a glimpse of what it's going to look like when it's completed. Of course, you can only ever see so much of the Star Factory from the ground, but in these pictures provided by Skywatch, you can also see the huge expansion going on in the center of the structure. The Star Factory is truly a massive building, as you can see from the satellite imagery, and personally, I wouldn't be surprised if the Stargate building and the High Bay eventually get demolished and replaced with yet another Mega Bay to support support all of the hardware Star Factory churns out. Over at the office building, it's continuing to rise out of the ground as crews are now working on its third level. In its final form, this building will feature five stories, so not too much longer to go here on the main structure. Looking at this satellite image, it almost seems like the building will have a half shield shape, where some of the center space will be left open. This could be for some space between buildings, or just like a courtyard for employees to rest in, or something else. Either way, it's an interesting thing to see from a vantage point in space. Speaking of resting and recreation, the new rec center and sushi restaurant over at the edge of the village already have a small footprint where the ground is being prepared for them. Something tells me the sushi restaurant will be for SpaceX employees only, but uh, what I wouldn't give for some really good sushi here in Brownsville. Please, 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 SpaceX, please. Okay, that's plenty of office spaces and parking garages. Let's move here to the orbital launch site and discuss all of the activity we've seen this week as SpaceX gets ready for Starship Flight 4. Over in front of the Gateway to Mars sign, there's been more infrastructure and foundation work. Overall, the launch site is slowly becoming more and more sophisticated and cleaned up versus how it's previously looked when it was basically just a pile of dirt on a sandbar. You can also see the work ongoing at the location of the second tower in this clip in the background. Of course, the foundation work in front of the sign could also have some relation to the second orbital pad, but that remains to be seen. It could be a temporary access road for construction crews, or perhaps a staging area for equipment, or maybe the entire Gateway to Mars wall will be torn down and moved to make more room for the second pad expansion. We'll just have to wait and see. From space, you can see how this old parking lot is already being used more as a hardware staging area. I like how we call it an old parking lot, even though it's basically a brand new parking lot that they just built classic SpaceX, build it, figure out it's in the way, tear it down, move it somewhere else, build it again, and repeat. From space, you can see how a bunch of equipment is being stored at the danger lot. Maybe that's in preparation for construction of the second tower and pad. The newly created berm expansion is looking sharp as well, but with SpaceX clearing more ground right next to the recently finished berm, it could be the beginning of even more protective work here. 
you can see the ground being flattened, which usually indicates imminent ground and foundation work. As we've learned in the past, nothing in Starbase is forever, and some things are even shorter than expected. Part of the Gateway to Mars sign, or rather, the wall next to it, was removed, and it's most likely in the way of crews working on Starbase's second launch pad. Here you can see the aftermath of the wall removal, and it seems like this is kind of a rough cut, which might indicate that the rest of the wall, or at least the part next to it, will also be not long for this world. From space, thanks Skywatch, you can already see the footprint for the second orbital pad. You can see it's directly next to the wall, so at some point a berm will probably be constructed here similar to the orbital tank farm berm. And this wall is probably not rated to withstand direct raptor firings, so modifications are certainly expected here. Seeing parts of the wall or the full wall knocked down won't be a surprise. Over at the tank farm, work to remove the rest of the vertical tanks is ongoing. This week we've seen a whole bunch of vacuum trucks pulling up to the orbital tank farm and sucking out all of the insulation, which is perlite, that fills the void inside the outer and inner tank. Once that process is complete, the outer tank shell can be removed, then the inner tank scrapped as well. So be prepared to say goodbye to more of these tanks soon. One of the remaining tanks is also saying goodbye soon, and you can see workers marking it up for future cutting. We have seen them cutting these pieces in the past to make removal of the outer tank shell much easier. Looking at the tank farm from space, you can see how many horizontal hot dog tanks are in place at this point, which are of course there to replace the old vertical tanks. The footprint of the new tank farm is extremely massive. Don't get confused though, the tank farm to the south is, of course, the dedicated deluge system tank farm, which is hooked directly up to the pad. Over at the launch tower, specifically the ship quick disconnect arm, not much work has been done since Flight 3. Still, besides the replacement of some insulation and minor GSC pipe work. This video was sponsored by Novium. They make really cool magnetically hovering pens that are a great addition to any workspace and an awesome gift idea for Mother's Day. Novium hover pens are inspired by space and are a great artful way to have a little reminder of the coolness of weightlessness in your workspace. I really like to have things on my desk and in my work area that inspire my curiosity and creativity and of course that make my brain happy. Hey, does your mom have a desk? Does your mom like space too? Hover pens. The Interstellar Edition has a tilt of 23.5 degrees, reminiscent of the Earth's axis of rotation. It's available in several great colors like Space Black and Mars Magma. Plus, there are premium editions made with 18 karat gold and they have a real meteorite embedded in them. It's possibly the oldest object you'll touch in your lifetime. I personally really like the look of the Future Edition, which features an interchangeable tip so you can switch between a rollerball or a fountain tip and go back and forth as desired. I mean, just look at these babies spin. What's not to like? Hover pens are not only high-end pens that provide an excellent writing experience, but they just look so dang cool. Look, I get it, Mother's Day gifts can be hard, you don't know what to get her, you don't know what to do. Hey, if she has a desk or a place where she works on things, a really cool little pen that looks awesome and every time she sees it she thinks of you, now that's a good gift. Use code NSF to get 10% off plus free shipping on all hover pens, and use the link in the description so Novium knows that we sent you. Thanks to Novium for sponsoring this video, and once again, thanks to them for making a cool product as well. Now, go, make your mom happy, get her a cool pen. Moms are great, they deserve cool gifts on Mother's Day. All right, now let's talk about starships. But before we get into discussing the vehicles for Flight 4, let's take a look at all of the other vehicles that have been moved around Starbase this week. I'm talking, of course, about Booster 13 and Ship 30. Checking in at the beginning of the week, in Mega Bay 2, we can see Ship 30. It was suspected to roll out over the week as testing of the upper stage for Flight 5 is expected before Flight 4. Speaking of future flights, here is Booster 13 in cryo-testing at the Massey test site. The methane tank, which is the upper tank, was cryo-tested the other night, so now we see its lower tank, which was its LOX tank, then we saw another load, this time of both tanks before both tanks were then detanked, completing its cryo-proof campaign. As a reminder, Booster 13 is currently expected to fly on Starship Flight 6, so it could be a catch candidate. As the vehicle's being cryogenic-proof tested and filled with liquid nitrogen, they vent out gaseous nitrogen, which has already boiled, so they have more space to fit in liquid nitrogen, hence the constant venting you see during a cryo-test and fueling in general. During the week, Anthony Gomez from Rocket Ranch did us the awesome favor of taking us down the Rio Grande via a boat so we could take a look at Massey's from another perspective, and here you can see Booster 13 looking sharp as ever. Of course, no grid fins or hot stage ring yet, but 
that'll come in time. Speaking of checking things out, we can also check out the ship quick disconnect for the ship static fire stand at the Massey Outpost. The stand is still under construction, but it seems like the time when we no longer see static fires at the suborbital launch site is approaching fast. So with Booster 13 having completed its cryo-proof testing campaign, it was rolled back to the production site and back into Mega Bay 1, where we expect it will be receiving its 33 Raptor engines. All right, now let's talk about good old Ship 30. As we waited for the return of vehicles to the launch site, we got a good indicator of what was about to happen. And that was the LR-11000 crane was moved over to suborbital pad B. We figured this was most likely in preparation for the testing of Ship 30, which of course will need a lift onto the pad. Meanwhile, back at the production site, we then saw the two-point lifting rig, which is a chopstick-like lift system, moved over to Mega Bay 2, where Ship 30 was eagerly waiting. So there we had two strong indicators that Ship 30 was about to be transported. Sure enough, at the launch site, the LR-11000 crane was also being prepared to lift Ship 30, as it also needs a two-point lifter to get the job done here. At this point, with road closures scheduled, it was clear what was about to happen, and sure enough, it did. Just late at night. You can see Ship 30 being moved out of the Mega Bay and placed on its transport stand to roll out to the launch pad. Its heat shield looks so good, although it's likely that deep inspections will follow after the static fire campaign we expect it will undergo. So potentially, we'll see a situation close to Ship 29 where a lot of the tiles are removed after its shakedown. Like I said, the ship rolled at night with SPMTs as always used for the roll. It went quite fast as these rolls have become more and more routine for SpaceX. The expectation is that SpaceX will try and perform a spin prime and, if possible, a static fire before Flight 4 occupies all attention at the launch site. This would help them optimize the flow for a quick turnaround to Flight 5. It's a really optimized machine that SpaceX is building here, and you can already see how a quick turnaround to Flight 5 could be decided now, as this is probably a really important step to enable it. Also, check out this shot where I stuck a GoPro on top of the car and followed the ship down Highway 4 and people complain about LA traffic. In case you wondered if the ship has engines, of course the answer is yes. You can barely see them here while the SPMT is close to one of our cameras, but sure enough, there's three vacuum raptors and three sea level raptors replete with booties. Once at the launch site, Ship 30 was then hooked up to the LR-11000 crane in preparation for its lift. And that lift came fast, as in on the same night. Ship 30 rose into the air in a classic crane-assisted takeoff for you veteran tank watchers out there. Now let's turn our attention to the Flight 4 vehicles, that's Ship 29 and Booster 11, and everything that's been going on here at the orbital launch site to get ready for their return. We still have chopstick work ongoing, and of course we're awaiting Ship 29 and Booster 11's return to testing, but it seems like it's not that far away. At the orbital launch mount, we saw workers performing work on the booster quick disconnect. Specifically, they're working on the hood mechanism, it seems. One of the workers here is climbing inside the area in between the hood and the QD itself. Another interesting observation this week was the test of the booster hold-down clamps. We can see here how the LR-11000 crane was hooked to an adapter on the ground, and this adapter connects the crane to the hold-downs on the mount, which were recently modified. The testing of the hold-downs is probably necessary after all the modifications that have been done to them to make sure the individual hold-downs work before stress testing it with a full super heavy booster. Of course, a crane can't create as much force on a hold-down as a full booster, but Testing each of them individually is 100% doable. Other parts of the launch pad and other supporting hardware are progressing in their testing as well. We saw the spool up of several parts of the tank farm, indicated by venting, which was most likely used to purge some propellant lines and verify operational status ahead of vehicles arriving at the pad. Basically, everything appeared to be getting a once-over after all of the recent tank farm changes. Also, the chopsticks were tested again. After their modification, they're being moved quite a bit by SpaceX to test out their new speed and verify the new upgrades. Compared to their previous speed, the chopsticks are really moving now, and it seems like we're one step closer to SpaceX being able to catch a booster out of thin air. But how many more steps will there be? Who knows? Let us know in the comments what you think. During the chopsticks test, the sticks moved and stopped from time to time. It seems SpaceX wants to verify the controls are working as expected. Next up, at the very end of the tank farm, we also saw some of the new vaporizers spool up for a bit, as SpaceX verified the integrity of that system. We even saw the pad and tower spool up for a bit, which means the lines all the way from the tank farm to the QD system were used during this in-depth tank farm verification test. One of the funniest clips this week is this one. You can see workers waiting for the test to end because as soon as the pad is remotely safe again, suddenly a load of man lifts 
lifts, cranes, and workers go up and start working instantly. It's quite a view. In the ongoing cycle of tank farm verification, you can see the tower and pad vent going from time to time, while the chopsticks are also constantly calibrated and tested. Stage Zero is a really incredible machine that SpaceX has built here, and now we can see them really getting it ready for the return of Flight 4 vehicles. And I gotta say, all of this testing sure makes me optimistic that Flight 4 will indeed be soon, hopefully by the end of May. After all the testing, workers examined the chopsticks again and are preparing for a potential lift of the Flight 4 vehicles. You can see how complex these chopsticks are with all the wiring and pipes exposed. On the chopsticks, more of the new shielding bumpers are being installed, which are most likely to protect the chopsticks in case something impacts them during a launch or static fire. If you had any more parts of the system on the bingo card that were not tested in the last few days, you're probably close to crossing them off as well. The ship QD, for example, was retracted and moved to the side. Of course, for Flight 4, we need one more thing, vehicles. We can see SpaceX placing more and more tiles on the skin of Ship 29 as they fix the final imperfections before flight. Re-entry will certainly be an important part of this flight, so going all the tiles with a fine tooth comb makes a lot of sense. Here you can see next to the flaps, they're having to place specially shaped tiles as the angle with the flaps makes it a bit awkward here. So with all the closures, what are we looking at in the next week? The good news is, probably testing of some kind. We have a bunch of road closures that are upcoming, which might even be outdated by the time you watch this, since things are changing so fast. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday are all marked as testing closures, likely for Ship 30. But wait, there's more. On Tuesday morning, there's another rollout closure, which could potentially be for Booster 11. There's another closure on Wednesday morning, which would either be for a Ship 30 transport back to the production site, or the return of Ship 29 to the launch site. So hopefully we see a full stack here at the launch site again soon, maybe as soon as this week. Thanks again to Novium for sponsoring this video. Don't forget, use code NSF to get 10% off shipping on all hover pens. And use the link in the description so Novium knows we sent you. So there you have it. That's the state of play here in Starbase. There were some road closures that were not used over the weekend, so we'll see what happens during the week. It seems like maybe there's been a few small delays. Either way, we'll keep you posted. Keep your eyes on Starbase Live. Thanks for watching, and as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.